Despite what a recent Supreme Court ruling might end up changing, Kate made a video on that earlier this week, link in the doohickey down here. The US Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, is currently responsible for setting emissions targets for all light-duty cars and trucks sold in the US today. Meanwhile, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA for short, is responsible for setting corporate average fuel economy, or CAFE, standards. These two agencies, acting on authority given to them by Congress, are empowered to not only set standards for vehicle emissions and fuel economy respectively, but also levy fines and penalties when automakers fail to meet those standards. And whatever you may or may not feel about the US and its politics, even if you're outside of the US, emission standards and cafe standards for the US vehicle fleet can dramatically impact what vehicle models automakers build and sell around the world. At the same time, though, neither emissions nor cafe standards are anywhere near what they need to be for the US to transition its fleet to cleaner vehicles in a timely enough fashion for the US to make a meaningful impact on either the nation's air quality or indeed to expedite its transition to cleaner, greener vehicles, especially when considering the sticks, carrots and truck-sized loopholes that exist in the US federal standards that make it easier for automakers to continue to make heavily polluting vehicles. And just this week, the US EPA and NHTSA announced they'd come to an agreement with the latest in a long line of automakers found to be in non-compliance with emissions and fuel economy standards. General Motors. It has just been found in non-compliance for nearly 6 million vehicles made between 2012 and 2018, and its penance for doing so might actually make you just a little mad. So today, I'm going to look into this non-compliance, explain what the penalties that GM and the two federal agencies have come to an agreement over, and explain why, when we are facing record heat waves, devastating freak weather events, and much more, the EPA and NHTSA's approaches to emissions and economy aren't cutting it anymore. While today's video might be considered a little on the political side, and I acknowledge that isn't everyone's cup of tea, it's worth noting that the EPA and NHTSA both have important parts to play in keeping the air we breathe clean and the vehicles we travel in safe. Both agencies are non partisan. The EPA helps keep polluters in check and enforces fines and when required it follows up with more severe remedies to ensure our air, water and ground isn't polluted by those wanting to make a quick buck. NHTSA meanwhile ensures that the vehicles we travel in are for the most part safe, at least for the occupants, and enforces regulations designed to keep our vehicles and the people who travel in them safe. If your vehicle gets an official recall, it's usually because of a safety issue that's arisen because a vehicle is not in compliance with federal vehicle motor safety standards, which NHTSA is responsible for setting. And Volkswagen's Dieselgate debacle? That was prosecuted by the Justice Department in collaboration with the EPA. Of course, it isn't all good. One of the reasons why automakers are making larger and larger vehicles is basically because as the vehicle gets larger, its emissions requirements and fuel economy targets become less stringent. A loophole that the auto industry is very happy to exploit. In fact, I could make an entire video on that topic. But today it's all about GM and its complete and utter failure to meet EPA and CAFE standards. According to the official press release posted by the EPA, General Motors and the EPA has come to an agreement concerning excess CO2 emissions from 5.9 million vehicles made by GM between 2012 and 2018, split between 4.6 million light-duty pickup trucks and 1.3 million SUVs that the EPA says are, quote, currently in use, end quote. The vehicles are found to be in non-compliance with emissions regulations following an EPA investigation in which it was discovered that, on average, the nearly 6 million vehicles affected were producing at least 10% more carbon dioxide than GM's official greenhouse gas compliance reports suggested they were. And in related news, just last week, GM and NHTSA came to an agreement after the same investigation from the EPA discovered that GM's fuel economy figures from many of its 2008 to 2010 model year vehicles were well above what they'd actually been achieving in the real world. In this case, NHTSA fined GM 145.8 million US dollars and cancelled more than 30.6 million fuel economy credits accrued during those model years.
What we don't know, sadly, is if GM was using some form of cheat device in its vehicles, or if this was some error in testing, or in fact just out of touch wishful thinking on GM's part that failed to properly account for the difference between GM's lab testing of emissions and real world. Regardless, though, it is the latest indictment of what is an endemic problem across the entire auto industry in which seemingly every automaker who produces an internal combustion engine vehicle is misrepresenting real-world admissions to official agencies and in which an unsettling majority of automakers, electric and otherwise, are quoting fuel economy and range estimates that are completely divorced from the real world. In penance for its misdeeds, GM has agreed with the EPA to give up about 50 million metric tonnes of greenhouse gas credits to, quote, resolve excess CO2 emissions, end quote. And as I've already detailed, it's come to the aforementioned agreement with NHTSA. And at this point, I'm sure you'd like to know what those greenhouse gas credits are and what fuel economy credits are. And I'd love to make a full in-depth video explaining this all in great detail, but for the purposes of this video, even though technically it's far more complex, we can think of the greenhouse gas credits as permission to pollute, a carbon credit if you will. And while some people will argue with me that fuel economy credits are slightly different because they're tied to economy rather than emissions, they all do the same thing. And for now, I'm going to focus on greenhouse gas credits. One credit is the equivalent of about one tonne of carbon dioxide removed from the atmosphere. And when an automaker wants to make a car that is a heavy polluter, it needs to have carbon credits on hand to offset the emissions that the vehicle is responsible for. If, on the other hand, an automaker makes nothing but EVs and its average fleet-wide emissions are well underneath the EPA targets, it basically earns credits. Credits which can then be sold on to automakers whose vehicles aren't all that clean or low emission. Tesla has benefited greatly from this cap and trade emissions program for the auto industry and for many years sales of its excess carbon credits have earned it a pretty penny. Last year, for example, Tesla made a record $1.79 billion in sales of excess credits it had accrued. And because automakers whose fleet-wide emissions don't meet EPA standards face a massive fine for non-compliance, most would just rather buy those credits from a rival firm with excess than face the wrath of the federal government. GM, like every legacy automaker that produces EVs, earns carbon credits every time it sells an EV. And those credits directly go towards offsetting the emissions of its most heavily polluting vehicles. Those massive F-150 pickup trucks and Chevy Silverados with emissions in excess of three to 400 grams of CO2 per mile? <laughs> Don't worry, their terrible emissions are made possible in part by every F-150 Lightning and Mustang Marquee that rolls off the production line, and in part by every all-electric GM vehicle that GM produces. And in the same way, fuel economy credits allow automakers to offset the terrible non-compliance of fuel economy of its heaviest, most gas-guzzling vehicles with the earned credits from all of its electric vehicles. Or in some cases, credits earned by Tesla, which it then pays cold hard cash for because it's cheaper than paying fines. I am sure at this point that there are people ready to scream and point at the screen and accuse every EV owner whose vehicles are made by a legacy automaker as being a complicit enabler of polluters. And as a Chevrolet Bolt EV and F-150 Lightning owner, my two vehicles and their well below target emissions earned their respective automakers credits. Credits whose end purpose was to facilitate high emissions somewhere else in the system. In a similar way, fuel economy credits allow automakers to use high efficiency vehicles to offset the terrible emissions and fuel economy of whatever the latest gas guzzling SUV or pickup truck in vogue happens to be. And I get it. I get the anger. I get why many people don't want to support legacy automakers. But the sad fact is that because of this system, if you have purchased any kind of EV from any company in the US and many other countries in the around the world with similar cap and trade programs, you too have played a part in this theatrical performance. Even Tesla's help enable this because Tesla sells its credits, admittedly at a profit that benefits Tesla, the companies who are definitely still not meeting their requirements. Worse still, these kind of fines being levied against companies that are found to be in non-compliance are laughable. 
take the NHTSA fine against GM for its misstating of fuel economy. For two model years of vehicles, it's just been fined $145.8 million. That's a lot of cash for most people. But last year, GM's annual gross profit was $19.138 billion. In other words, the fine for getting its fuel economy figures wrong was less than 1% of the company's total earnings for last year. To put that in context, it would be the equivalent of someone earning the US annual salary of just under 60,000 US dollars being fined about $453 for some misdeed or another, which might not feel too small until you remember that GM's misdeeds here for hastened death for people by worsening air pollution and made it harder for us to rein in climate change as a society and many of their non-compliant vehicles will still be on the road come 2040. And sure, many people on a $60,000 salary would find such a $450 fine painful. But let me remind you that GM recently announced that its board had authorised a stock buyback programme worth $6 billion and paid its CEO, Mary Barra, nearly $28 million last year in total compensation. Granted, that does pale into insignificance when you compare it to Elon Musk's recent windfall. But still, that's a lot of money. My point? These carbon and emission credits don't work. The federal guidelines that exist are designed to get automakers to make cleaner, greener vehicles, but they have been gutted and twisted and modified so much over the years by lobbyists and politicians and lawmakers that you can either buy your way into compliance or sneak in through the loopholes. We need a system that's not so easy to defeat if we're serious about more EVs. Except that would require automakers to invest more in EVs and less in profits for shareholders. It requires more social conscience, more altruism and less... less... I have no other word for it. Less greed. We need emissions and fuel economy standards that don't create exemptions based on vehicle size because all of those large full-size SUVs and pickup trucks, which are sadly becoming common around the world, exist because of the emissions, safety and fuel economy loopholes that have been written for them. And even when they're electric, they're still using vastly more resources both at point of manufacture, in use, and they demand massively more resource use for the infrastructure required to support them. I mean, you only have to look at the size of a pickup truck from the 1990s and a pickup truck from today to see that while the average size of a truck has grown by a massive amount and its emissions have in some cases got worse rather than better, the actual load carrying capacity of your average pickup bed today is no larger than it was 30 years ago. And in many cases, it's actually smaller. And I'm going to pretend I didn't just acknowledge that 1990 was 34 years ago. I'm old. I wish that this was a more upbeat video and I wish that this was an occasional problem, but this happens every year and pretty much every automaker to date has exaggerated figures for regulatory purposes. Some of that, though, is honestly because official tests aren't particularly relevant to real world conditions and result in automakers like Tesla constantly and severely overquoting their real world ranges, while other automakers severely underquote their ranges. But the very same thing happens for emissions, too. And how do I put this? If your scientific method is so vague that you're continuously getting data that's got more in common with a work of fiction than a peer-reviewed scientific paper, you, you have a problem. Solving this will take time. It will take a seismic shift in the way that regulatory bodies make and apply rules to automakers. It will take a massive shift in the way that automakers are fined for non-compliance. I'm talking about a few bars of gold press latinum for every violation, fines that make automakers groan in the nads. And I'm also talking about us, citizens and concerned non-citizens, talking about these issues and making sure that those who can vote do vote 
to ensure that the folks in control of making laws and empowering agencies to enforce regulations take steps to ensure that experts in lifetime appointments don't decide that they're beer? I mean, that they are emissions experts? Finally. We need to make it harder for corporations with deep pockets spending money to influence lawmakers and elected officials into believing that their solutions are the right ones. After all, in an ideal world, altruism and the desire to do good for others would be all we'd need to make the world a better place. But sadly, greed isn't about to make that happen. So we need a sea change in the way we approach this problem, and that's something that we all need to demand. Thanks for joining me today. And if you've got thoughts, make sure you leave them below in our Discord chat room or you can reach out to us on Mastodon. Thanks to the amazing list of people scrolling by on your screen right now. They are some of the more than 1,500 people who help fund this channel through Patreon and YouTube. They help cover our bills, pay our team, and they make sure that we can remain 100% independent. If you'd like to join them and see your name listed here, just follow the links below. There are a range of different tiers you can sign up for from as little as $1 a month, or if you pay yearly, just over $10 a year. A massive welcome to our newest supporters, Carol Bulawa, Rolfondo, Michael Owen, Winter and Wilton Live. To join the list and get your shout out, become a paid Patreon member for your week of fame. And of course, if you'd like to support us with a one-off donation, you'll find links below to make Kofi and Bitcoin donations. We even have a good old-fashioned PO box that you can reach us at. Address you'll find linked below. And of course, if you're in need of some swag, you'll find our swag store in the down below as well. This month, we are celebrating Pride with an amazing new t-shirt design by our in-house artist and animator, Erin. You can get yours today by heading to our Redbubble store. We've also got some fantastic content coming up, so make sure that you've hit the subscribe button on either Peertube or YouTube, and we'll see you soon. We make new videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. If you want more, the mighty algorithm thinks you'll like this video, but we think this one is also well worth a look. See you soon, and as always, keep evolving! <laughs>